Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the, the invitation to speak with you today. Uh, as Dr. Nell said, I am finishing up ID fellowship, uh, transitioning to faculty actually on, on Thursday, officially. Uh, at the University of North Carolina in the Division of Infectious Diseases. I have long had an interest in global health and during ID fellowship also developed an interest in antimicrobial stewardship. And these interests combined have led to some uh, research projects looking at how we can uh, apply tools for antimicrobial stewardship in resource constrained settings. So today um, I plan to talk a little bit about antibiotic stewardship in general um, and focus on respiratory illness, because obviously antimicrobial stewardship is an incredibly broad topic that could be a whole series of lectures on its own. Um, so I'm going to take focus on, on respiratory illness and uh, what you'll kind of see how that, that uh, became my area of interest as we move forward. So we know that existing antibiotics, the ones that we have now, are a limited resource. So development of new antibiotics is slow. Uh, the pipeline, there's not a lot in it right now in terms of new antibiotic therapies. Um, and those antibiotics that exist uh, are becoming less effective due to the development of antimicrobial resistance, as we all know. In addition, the new antibiotics that are developed are often very expensive, and that limits their distribution to only certain parts of the world, at least initially uh, when they are first developed. So there is an urgent need uh, to optimize the use of antibiotics, and this is the foundation for antimicrobial stewardship. I'm going to focus primarily on antibiotic stewardship today, although obviously stewardship of antiparasitic drugs like antimalarials and antifungals is equally appropriate or equally important, and some of the same tools could be applied there. But in general, antibiotic stewardship consists of uh, improving antibiotic prescribing both by clinicians and use by patients so that antibiotics are only prescribed and used when needed. It also incorporates minimizing misdiagnoses or delayed diagnoses, which lead to an underuse of antibiotics. So we wanna make sure that their full benefit is realized. And then also we want to ensure that when antibiotic is needed, the right drug dose and duration are selected um, as well as the right route of therapy. Uh, essentially, in summary, we want to optimize antibiotic use so that we use it when it confers a benefit to the patient um, and not when it has uh, only uh, an increased risk to the patient. So antimicrobial stewardship is one of the three pillars of the WHO integrated approach to health system strengthening. The other two are infection prevention and control and then medication and patient safety. And together, these three pillars are, are, are meant to form an integrated approach towards universal health coverage. And the reason that it's considered so important is that it's been shown to improve patient outcomes, save healthcare costs, and minimize the unintended consequences of antibiotics. And we're all aware of these unintended consequences, which include the increased risk of C. diff infection, and then also just adverse effects from the drugs themselves, which are common even with oral antibiotics. I think there's uh, often a misconception that oral antibiotics are a benign intervention, that they can have side effects um, to patients as well. A study of all emergency department visits in the US for drug uh, adverse drug reactions among children demonstrated that almost half of those uh, drug reactions were attributed to antibiotics. So it's certainly uh, very common. In summary, antimicrobial stewardship, its overall goal is to maximize benefit because obviously antibiotics have saved countless lives and are an incredible innovation but also they have unintended consequences. So we want to be sure to use them appropriately to minimize harm. And one of those uh, unintended consequences of antibiotic use is the development of antimicrobial resistance. Antimicro antibiotic use and overuse is the leading driver of AMR uh, globally. This is a, a diagram from a Lancet paper about the drivers of antimicrobial resistance. And you can see that human and antibal, animal antimicrobial misuse or overuse um, are one of the uh, main drivers of antimicrobial resistance. And there's also a very strong evidence base to support this conclusion. Per the CDC as well, uh, inappropriate antibiotic use is the most important modifiable risk factor for antimicrobial resistance. Now, where are these antibiotics being used? So depending on the country, it is estimated that 60 to 90% of antimicrobial uh, prescriptions are actually occur in the outpatient setting. 
And so that's where we're kind of gonna focus our discussion today. Addressing the issue of antibiotic overuse and antimicrobial resistance on a local scale will not be enough. Although we're still learning about the mechanisms of human to human transmission for AMR organisms, it is clear that there is an association with travel. We live in a global world, and so this is a global problem. Um, travel related spread of AMR has been documented with carbapenemase resistant Enterobacteraceae, with Streptococcus pneumoniae, with cephalosporin resistant gonorrhea. And so what happens in India matters to uh, places in the US, what happens in Europe matters to Sub-Saharan Africa. It's, it's truly a global problem. And it's imperative that stewardship efforts also be a global initiative to address this. So improving antibiotic use is obviously a very large task to take on. Um, fortunately, there are multiple guideline documents out there that outline kind of the core elements of stewardship and how to go about beginning to address this problem. The WHO and the CDC both have guidelines that are actually specific to resource limited settings as well. Um, almost all of the, the core element documents identify um, figuring out what the high priority conditions are for intervention as one of the first steps. So this is figuring out conditions where antibiotics are overprescribed, underprescribed, or misprescribed. And then the next step is to understand the gold standard practice for antibiotic prescribing for those, uh, those conditions. So that may be a national clinical guideline, that may be a facility-based more local guideline, um, but basically understanding the standard that you're trying to reach and then identifying barriers that lead to a deviation from that standard. And there's lots of different reasons why uh, daily practice may not live up to, or may not match um, the, the clinical practice guidelines. So what are some high priority, potential high priority conditions for intervention? One such uh, high priority condition is acute respiratory illness. So, what is encompassed by acute respiratory illness varies by context. Uh, for the purposes of this discussion today, I will use it broadly to incorporate both upper and lower respiratory disease, which includes bronchitis, bronchiolitis, upper, upper respiratory tract infections, sinusitis, viral, sin uh, viral pharyngitis. Um, so basically all kind of upper and lower acute respiratory illnesses. So ones that um, start within or that are usually uh, less than a week of symptoms uh, when evaluated. So ARI in general is incredibly common among all age groups across the world. If you look at the Lancet Global Burden of Disease Assessment, if one groups together respiratory illnesses, including uh, HIV negative tuberculosis, so a bit of even broader group, um, respiratory illness accounts for 153 million disability adjusted life years and 3.7 million deaths in 2019, with the burden being highest in sub-Saharan Africa and in young children and the elderly. The Lancet Global Burden of Disease Analysis also breaks it down by upper and lower respiratory tract infection. This map shows the relative burden of disease globally for cough, uh, acute nasopharyngitis, sinusitis, rhinosinusitis and rhinopharyngitis, as well as tracheitis and supraglottitis. So basically any sort of upper respiratory tract infection. And you can see that the primary burden is in North America, South America, and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. A slightly different pattern emerges when looking at lower respiratory and tract infection, which for this uh, analysis included clinician diagnosed and self-reported cases of pneumonia, bronchiolitis, and influenza-like illness. And you can see the, the primary burden of disease is, is in Sub-Saharan Africa in general. Lower respiratory tract infections represent the fourth leading cause of DALIs worldwide as of 2019, and the second most common cause of death in children under five. Looking more closely at a, at a resource limited setting in Sub-Saharan Africa, specifically in Tanzania, uh, acute respiratory illness also represents a large subset of, of pediatric febrile illnesses presenting to the outpatient setting. So this study is from two clinics in Tanzania. It's a study of 1,005 febrile out, 
about patients who presented to the clinics for evaluation. And in this analysis, those who met uh, emergency signs per WHO emergency triage recommendations were excluded. Um, but some individuals with more severe illness, but not emergency illness, were, were included. Um, and basically what they found is that only 9% of individuals had malaria. So as you are all well aware, previously, um, it, like in the, in the 2008 Integrated Management of Childhood Illness Guidelines, the W. WHO actually recommended empiric treatment for all children with fever in endemic areas with antimalarials. But now as there's expanded availability of MRDT tests, so malaria rapid diagnostics, we are now real realizing that the majority of these children with fever actually did not have malaria, although it certainly varies by season and by specific location. Um, in this study, only 9% of children were diagnosed with malaria. Whereas two thirds of the children presented with some sort of acute respiratory illness and 70% of these illnesses were localized to the upper respiratory tract. It was most, the most common diagnosis made in uh, all age groups uh, presenting uh, to these clinics. So clearly a very common problem um, throughout the world. So what is causing these acute respiratory illnesses? Well, the studies have shown uh, in a multitude of settings that most ARI in the outpatient setting is viral and or self-limited. So going back to that study in Tanzania, they tested um, in all the individuals who presented with acute respiratory illness for respiratory viruses by uh, PCR. And they were able to identify a causative virus in 81% of the children. And even this even includes uh, those individuals who had non-radiologically confirmed pneumonia or radiologically confirmed pneumonia, so both upper and lower respiratory tract disease. And they comment that, quote, in the absence of any particular outbreak, common childhood viral illnesses or diseases are as frequent in Africa as in any other continent. Even in the US, uh, when looking at causes of hospitalized community acquired pneumonia, so these are, are sicker children who were diagnosed with pneumonia and hospitalized because of their symptoms, we find that uh, the majority of cases, particularly in younger children, only a viral pathogen is detected. So you can see here, this is looking at the entire uh, age or entire cohort age zero to 17. And you can see that almost 70% of, of children only had one viral pathogen identified or two viral pathogens. And only uh, a small proportion, a little more than 10% had a bacterial pathogen detected. So even in more severe illness, it seems that viruses could maybe explain um, the, the cause of illness. Sorry about that. So despite this information that acute respiratory illness is primarily a viral illness, the ARI remains the most frequent indication for antibiotic use among outpatients. And depending on the country, it, it appears that 50 to 70% of this antibiotic use may be inappropriate or not in compliance with local guidelines. In the US, in one large study where they looked at all antibiotic prescriptions in the outpatient setting from 2010 to 2011, they found that 221 prescriptions per 1,000 people were given for acute respiratory illness, and over half of them were unnecessary or inappropriate. So that is either they were unnecessary completely or were the inappropriate uh, drug choice duration or um, dosage. In the Tanzania study, the authors uh, concluded based on their thorough clinical assessment and diagnostic testing that less than 13% of the children who presented with ARI required treatment with antibiotics. So this is clearly uh, an area of, of uh, high priority for intervention from a stewardship standpoint. So what tools do we have in our stewardship toolkit to try and address this? In the outpatient setting, there have been multiple different things that have been studied either independently or in combination. Um, one such thing is provider education, obviously, which has documented efficacy in multiple randomized control trials. And this either consists of kind of large group training sessions or uh, informational handouts or even uh, more intense kind of one on one interactions. Similarly, provider feedback is an important component of stewardship, and so this primarily consists of what's called audit and feedback. So 
a third party individual will uh, evaluate a particular provider's antimicrobial prescribing practices and compare them to local standards of care and then give feedback to the provider about how they are doing. Um, and then in sometimes they even, they're, um, they have used comparison to other peers. So they'll send an email showing how antibiotic prescribing compares to other top performers in the same practice. And this has shown to decrease antibiotic prescribing um, among, or inappropriate antibiotic prescribing, I should say, among providers. And the comparison to peer element actually has a durable effect. So some of these interventions, their impact falls off once the intervention stops. So once the study is over, uh, prescribing will return to, to pre-intervention um, pre levels. However, the peer comparison component seemed to have a durable effect even 12 months later. Patient education obviously is important, although there is limited evidence for its use on its own. Uh, in the US, patient education often occurs in just the interactions that we have with patients every day um, and is often uh, a part of, of one other technique that we that is used commonly called uh, delayed prescribing. So this is actually something that's been shown to be acceptable to patients and to significantly reduce antibiotic use without increasing adverse outcomes. And it essentially says, you know, here's a prescription for this antibiotic, but don't use it unless you still feel bad in three days or give me a call. And if you're not feeling better in three days and I'll call in a prescription. So kind of a watchful waiting approach. And this works in areas where people have, you know, continuous access to or re reliable access to phones and reliable access to healthcare, but it may not be as uh, feasible in areas where that, that's not necessarily the case. We also often develop local guidelines. Uh, so for instance, the Carolina Antimicrobial Stewardship Program has developed a best practices guideline related to durations of antibiotics for common adult and pediatric conditions such as community acquired pneumonia or urinary tract infection that's distributed to the entire health system. Um, but obviously adherence to these guidelines is not mandatory, it's voluntary. So their impact is limited in that sense. For those settings that have electronic medical records, it's possible to uh, build in computerized clinician decision support uh, into the electronic medical records. So if a particular diagnosis is made, it might pop up an, uh, an advice box that says antibiotics are not usually indicated for this condition, or it may uh, suggest a duration if antibiotics are prescribed. Um, but obviously this is not feasible in settings without an electronic medical record. And uh, finally, or I, I shouldn't say finally, because there are, I'm sure, other tools, but uh, what I'm going to focus on today is the use of diagnostic testing to improve antimicrobial stewardship. So one of the things that I think drives antibiotic use is the fact that there's quite an overlap, particularly with respiratory illness, between the clinical features of a viral and a bacterial infection. So there's diagnostic uncertainty. And where diagnostic testing can come in um, and, and be helpful is it can kind of alleviate some of that uncertainty uh, and help make uh, decisions about antibiotics easier and make providers feel more confident in them. Um, an example of pathogen-specific testing is a group A rapid strep test. This is highly effective at targeting antibiotic therapy only to those who need it and can be done at the point of care. Um, we'll also talk more about biomarker testing in, in just a bit. Um, the Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance from the WHO also identifies point of care diagnostics as being very important uh, from a standpoint of detecting antimicrobial resistance in order to choose the best initial therapy. However, these tests all have costs associated with them. Um, and so, you know, the WHO definitely points out that the applicability and affordability of these techniques in low and mental income settings must, must be considered in their development. Um, also, they require a blood draw, which within the pediatric population can be difficult. And in areas where, for instance, community health workers are a key part of the medical system who may not have phlebotomy skills, um, this may be a, a limitation in their, in their use and an important consideration when developing diagnostic tests. So for acute respiratory illness specifically, there are several uh, different tests that we can use. So in regards to pathogen specific testing, in, in addition to the rapid strep test that we talked about, 
there's obviously testing for influenza, both antigen and PCR testing at the point of care that's available. And these tests have been shown to improve targeted use of oseltamivir and may also decrease antibiotic treatment as well, although it depends on the study and the setting in which it's used and how fast the result comes back, uh, whether or not the, the impact um, on antibiotic use is seen. And then in addition, there are these new multiplex viral respiratory panels on the right. You'll see the, the device for the biofire, the, the machine for the biofire, which is a popular one here in the US. And these test for 22 to 24 uh, viral and atypical bacterial pathogens all at once. And the test itself only takes about an hour. So it's a fast turnaround time. Um, and their impact on antibiotic use is, it remains, uh, I think, conflicting. Uh, we actually studied a precursor to the biofire here at UNC and found that it, a positive test did change management in about 20% of patients, um, but there were still a significant percentage of patients for whom a positive test result, viral test result, did, did not change uh, management. So there's obviously other, other factors at play in, in antimicrobial or antibiotic prescribing. Clinical biomarkers. Um, can kind of help with this, these uncertainties. So I think part of why providers may not discontinue antibiotics in response to a positive viral test may be concern for bacterial superinfection, which certainly can happen with viral infections. And so a positive viral test doesn't rule out the presence of a concurrent bacterial infection. C-reactive protein and procalcitonin are biomarkers that are elevated in general in bacterial illness. And can therefore kind of, because they're not specific to one particular pathogen, um, can kind of add more information of, um, about what patients are at higher risk for having a bacterial infection and therefore needing antibiotics. The CRP in particular has been studied in numerous high income and resource limited settings. And when used for decision-making about whether or not to give antibiotics has been shown to safely decrease antibiotic use without increasing adverse outcomes um, to varying degrees, depending on the cutoff used of and the setting. In the US actually pediatric pneumonia guidelines recommend against the use of these clinical biomarkers primarily due to their inability to reliably distinguish between bacterial and viral infection. Um, there is certainly not like one cutoff where above that for your procalcitonin or CRP, you definitely have a bacterial infection or below that you definitely have a viral infection. We've seen that with COVID. COVID obviously causes very high CRPs even without concurrent bacterial infection. So they're not perfect at differentiating viral and bacterial, but they have been shown to be tools that regardless of etiology of illness can identify children who can safely not receive antibiotics in the setting of respiratory illness. In the UK, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence does recommend using the CRP at the point of care to inform decision-making. And the same evidence that supported this guideline also was incorporated, uh, this is from the South African Medical Journal, into this clinical practice statement. Um, so uh, encouraging the use of CRP in the situations where you have someone presenting with an acute cough or lower respiratory symptoms, where there is diagnostic uncertainty. So it's not clear they have a bacterial pneumonia. It's not clear they have an acute bronchitis, which is almost always viral. And so using the CRP with the cutoff shown here can help uh, inform antibiotic decision-making safely. So focusing a little bit more on the CRP, I wanna highlight this very cool study that was done in Tanzania. Um, so it, this is a randomized controlled non-inferiority study among children presenting with acute febrile illness to outpatient clinics in Dar es Salaam. Um, and they focused on children under age five um, who are older than two months of age. And they uh, basically randomized them to undergo care based on two different algorithms. So the first on the top, uh, they called Almanach, and it was an algorithm that was based on the 2008 version of IMCI, um, where presumptive malaria treatment was given for all febrile illnesses. And it incorporated the MRDT, but specifically for the evaluation of acute respiratory illness, it incorporated more clinical symptoms into the assessment. So looking for wheezing, duration of cough, and then counting of respiratory rate. 
in the IMCI guidelines currently for the WHO, the decision to prescribe antibiotics for um, ARI is made based on uh, the respiratory rate and if there's a presence of chest in drawing. So uh, if either of those are present, antibiotics are given or recommended. So they compared this kind of enhanced IMCI with clini uh, more clinical assessment to an electronic uh, algorithm that incorporated more point of care tests, like one of which was the hemoglobin, obviously still the MRDT, and then they incorporated CRP and procalcitonin tests for evaluation of, of different conditions. And for cough specifically, they used CRP with a cutoff of 80, um, with being high, if the child had it uh, CRP higher than 80, they would prescribe antibiotics, and if lower than 80, they would recommend the algorithm would recommend symptomatic treatment only. And then thirdly, in parallel, they enrolled a small cohort of children which who are managed by routine care, and that's the 2014 IMCI guideline, which I described uses respiratory rate and chest in drawing um, alone to decide whether or not a child with antibiotic um, or a child with respiratory illness requires antibiotics. And what they showed, uh, showed, I think, was pretty incredible. So when comparing the point of care testing arm to the routine care arm, and this is for all febrile illness first, um, they were able to reduce antibiotic prescriptions from 95% of children receiving them uh, to 11% in the point of care testing arm. And this uh, was without an increase in clinical failure at day seven. And even they saw a trend towards a decrease in clinical failures at day seven in the point of care arm. In their uh, planned secondary analysis, looking specifically at children with acute respiratory illness, uh, comparing the kind of enhanced clinical arm to the point of care testing arm, they saw a difference of between 40% receiving antimicrobial or antibiotic prescriptions in the Almanach arm to 2.3% in the point of care arm, with again a decrease uh, seen in clinical failures in the arm that utilize CRP for evaluation of respiratory illness. So shifting gears slightly, this is kind of the context that that uh, supports or or kind of provides a basis for, for the work that we've been doing in Uganda. So during my infectious disease fellowship, I have been fortunate enough to be part of a collaboration between the Mbarara University of Science and Technology and the University of North Carolina called the MustREC Research Collaboration. And this collaboration conducts research at multiple sites in southwestern Uganda, one of which is the Kasese Health Center in Kasese District, which is a, a level three health center that has a basic laboratory, a busy outpatient department, and a small inpatient ward. And this is what the, the, the um, health center looks like here. This is the outpatient department. So uh, recently, the Must UNC collaboration conducted a prospective study at Kasese Health Center looking at the prevalence of dengue seropositivity in children among um, children who presented with fever to the outpatient department. And similarly to what they had noted uh, elsewhere, they incidentally noted that the majority of children presenting with fever were testing negative for malaria, that many of them had respiratory symptoms like cough, and that when individuals were malaria negative and had cough, almost all were prescribed antibiotics, even though even if they didn't have uh, fast breathing or chest and drying. So we wanted to learn more about this group of, of children, uh, particularly in this area. And so we designed a, a prospective observational study that was primarily meant to gather data to inform future research projects and quality improvement initiatives. So purely observational data. We wanted to describe the current management and patient outcomes um, in this uh, patient population, try and use rapid point of care tests for pathogens to identify causes of febrile ARI, and then also measure the distribution of the clinical biomarkers among these children. We also uh, did a follow-up assessment and plan to look for associations between influenza test result, clinical biomarkers, and our outcomes of interest, which are listed here. This uh, demonstrates our study design. So in brief, we enrolled children age one to 10 who had fever and respiratory symptoms and were negative for malaria. We then tested those children if, if uh, the guardian provided consent for influenza with a nasopharyngeal swab using antigen testing because there's a point of care test available for that. Uh, also streptococcus pneumoniae with urine and then blood testing for CRP, procalcitonin and lactate. 
These results were not available in real time. So the treatment was per local standards of care. And then we did a follow-up assessment at seven days by phone uh, to see how the children were doing. We enrolled 225 children, the majority of whom were between one and five years of age and came from the area just surrounding Casese. So Casese is a town of about 100,000 people, but the majority of people came from kind of the peri-urban area around Casese town. No participant had received antibiotics or antimalarials in the two weeks leading up to this uh, presentation, and only one had been previously seen for the, the same condition. So this was definitely an acute illness cohort as we had intended. The most frequent self-reported symptoms were fever, cough, and rhinorrhea, not unexpectedly given our inclusion criteria, and we noted that severe illness was infrequent. So only seven children had an oxygen saturation less than 90% when, uh, when they presented. And severe pneumonia as defined by local Uganda guidelines was uh, um, uncommon. All but two of our participants uh, received antibiotic therapy and most commonly they were treated with amoxicillin, which is obviously the first sign treatment for pneumonia in the outpatient setting for WHO guidelines. And then the second most common was co cotrimoxazole, which interestingly, the majority of these uh, prescriptions were given in January. So I think it may have been a, a medication um, supply issue as opposed to choosing cotrimoxazole over amoxicillin. Only seven percent, only seven participants, or three uh, percent, were admitted to the inpatient department at KHC. Um, the rest were managed as outpatients and discharged to home. Um, I should note that four of the seven admitted participants had a weight for age that was less than third percentile, so malnutrition may have uh, played a role in the, in the admitting decision. We uh, noted that a surprising proportion of children were positive for influenza based on the antigen-based assay. And um, we chose the antigen-based assay because it is a uh, cassette that can be uh, used or the test can be done without electricity. It takes about 15 minutes. It only requires a few simple steps. So we chose it because of its, its ease of use, um, but it probably underestimates the number of cases of, of influenza, um, given that it, the antigen-based tests are less sensitive than the PCR-based tests. We saw both influenza A and influenza B, although as you can see on the right, the proportion of A and B varied in um, time uh, by study month, so changes kind of in, in the seasonal patterns of, of transmission. We also noted that about a third of children tested positive for Streptococcus pneumoniae using the urinary antigen test. And again, this is a test that was chosen because of its ease of use. It's a small card. You just dip a swab in urine and place it into the card. Um, but in children, it can pick up colonization in addition to true illness. However, studies have shown that when you combine a urine antigen test with an elevated CRP, it is predictive of primary endpoint pneumonia. And we didn't have any children that had both a CRP greater than 80 and a positive strep pneumo antigen. Overall, the levels of biomarkers in this population were low. Um, so using the cutoff of that previous Tanzania study of 80 milligrams per liter, only 2% of individuals in our study had a CRP that was greater than that. Um, looking at procalcitonin, one cutoff that has been proposed for pediatric illness before is 0 0.5 nanograms per milliliter, and only 10% of children um, had a, a procalcitonin that was higher than that. We were able to follow up 201 of the 225 patients at seven days, and none of the participants visited another health center or traditional healer for the same problem, and none received any additional antibiotics. There were no deaths or hospitalizations, and none of the participants still had fever um, at the seven-day mark. However, 59% did report some persistent symptom, which, with cough and runny nose being the most common, which I think supports uh, perhaps a viral etiology for their initial illness. And testing positive for influenza was also associated with having any persistent symptom. So applying our findings to a theoretical population of, of 100 children with malaria negative febrile ARI, with current standards of care, 99% of them would receive an antibiotic prescription. And I shouldn't say, I guess, standards of care, but current care practices in, in Uganda or in the area that we work. 
if we leverage the results of rapid testing, what proportion of antibiotic prescriptions could be avoided? So looking first at pathogen specific testing, um, if we if antibiotics were prescribed only to those who are influenza negative or those who are influenza positive and hypoxic, which may raise concern for a bacterial superinfection, 82% of, of antibiotics could be, antibiotic prescriptions could be avoided. Looking at providing antibiotics only if hypoxic or with a CRP greater than 40, only 15% of this theoretical population would receive antibiotics. So 85% of both, uh, regardless of flu positivity, 85% uh, of antibiotic prescriptions could have been avoided. And then finally, if antibiotics were given only if the child was hypoxic or had an elevated procalcitonin, again, regardless of flu results, only 10% of children uh, would have received antibiotics. So certainly our study, uh, it was not within our, our scope uh, to assess what would have happened to those children had they not received antibiotics. So I, we can't comment on that at all, but our, what we concluded from these preliminary data that there's much room for improvement in terms of stewardship among pediatric patients with non-malaria febrile ARI in this part of Uganda, and that incorporating clinical biomarker and or pathogen specific testing into management algorithms has the potential to reduce unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions and is also feasible in these lab settings. But FUSER research is needed to examine their safety, which is something that we're currently working on. And this is a study that has been delayed a bit because of COVID understandably, um, but is uh, planned and will hopefully begin enrolling soon. The village health workers in Uganda are often the first providers for whom uh, children under five, from whom children under five seek care in, rural, in this part of rural Uganda. And they are volunteers from the community who are kind of selected by the other community members to serve in this role. And they're trained on how to manage pneumonia, uh, malaria, and diarrhea based on ICCM protocols, but they do not receive, they are not clinicians. They haven't had any other formal training. And what we plan to do is a stepped wedge cluster randomized trial of routine care, um, which is the 2014 IMCI uh, protocols compared to a study algorithm that includes CRP for the management of acute respiratory illness. So we chose CRP in part because there are several point of care tests available that can be done using a capillary blood sample um, and it's just a little cassette. So very easy to use in, in the homes of the village health workers, which is where they, they see patients. So each, uh, all the villages will start out using routine care and then in a staggered fashion, we'll switch to using the study algorithm, which includes the CRP test. This will happen in Bugoye sub-county of Kasesi district and there will be 15 villages, five clusters of three villages each. And we're using a stratified randomization to make sure there is balance of altitude, proximity to health center and volume of patients seen um, across the clusters. So on the left, you can see a, a diagram of the, the ICCM protocol that will be used during the control time periods. And basically it's the following the, the current uh, WHO guidelines for treating based on symptomatic uh, presentation and, and uh, clinical assessment only, or clinical signs only. In our intervention period, when we use the study algorithm, they, the consented um, for the consented patients, the VHWs will perform a MRDT and a CRP. And then if there are danger signs present per the WHO guidelines, they will manage them per the usual ICCM protocols and refer them immediately to the health facility. If there are no danger signs present, they will refer to the CRP test results. And we chose a cutoff of 40 as, uh, as in this study, as compared to the Tanzanian study, which was at health facilities, this will be done with uh, individuals who have less clinical training. And so we wanted uh, to use a lower cutoff to ensure that we weren't missing any um, bacterial infections. Um, but the cutoff, the CRP will be used to make decisions about antibiotic use. Our primary outcome for this study um, will be antibiotic prescriptions. And then we will have a composite safety outcome as well that looks at clinical failure and includes persistence of fever, development of danger signs during the follow-up period and need for hospitalization or death. So that is uh, coming soon. And then finally, just briefly, um, there's an exciting area of study 
that instead of, uh, that is in line with, with kind of clinical biomarker testing, but takes it a step further. Um, so actually looking at the host immune response, um, which has been shown to be different in individuals with viral as opposed to bacterial infection. And uh, a group at Duke has actually developed a, a rapid test that measures gene expression, so patterns of gene expression um, in the host transcriptome to differentiate bacterial from viral illness. So instead of looking for pathogens, you're just looking at how the body is responding um, and using that to decide if a bacterial infection is involved. Um, so in that respiratory illness study that I mentioned in um, Kasese Health Center, we also stored samples from the cohort, uh, venous blood and nasopharyngeal samples in uh, nucleic acid media preserve or preservative media. And uh, we hope to do next generation sequencing to do more uh, pathogen detection, see if we can identify other pathogens that may have been the causative illness of the illness. And then also to look at host response gene signatures um, as other groups have done. So I am greatly appreciative of my mentors, Dr. Boyce and Dr. Giuliano in the US and Dr. Mulogo at the Mbarara University of Science and Technology in Uganda. And then this is a picture of our whole study team at Kasese Health Center, including the, the clinicians. And I'm very grateful to them. Um, they are incredible people to work with. Um, and I will be happy to take any questions at this point. Great, thank you so much. And that's a really, really awesome uh, overview of a really complicated topic. I always miss the applause button on Zoom. We need to add one in the next version. <laughs> um, but thank you, that's that's really awesome and some some really useful stuff. Um, a couple of questions that have come in, there's some on the, on the, on the Q&A thing, some on, uh, people have been SMSing me in that. Um, one question, I suppose, maybe because you, you know, that comes up to us in South Africa, but is with the HIV uh, component. Is there any indication mm -hmm. with HIV that it changes these kind of thresholds that you would maybe need a different threshold uh, in an HIV positive child as opposed to negative, or, or does it seem about the same? So uh, it, from the little that I've seen, it's, it seems about the same. However, obviously in an HIV positive child who is on um, who's not on antiretroviral therapy, the differential for a respiratory illness is, is much broader. And I think the, the threshold um, for starting antibiotic treatment, particularly to cover for, for opportunistic infections in the setting of a low CD4 count is, is uh, much, or the threshold is much lower. So um, we didn't, in, in our study, we didn't exclude children with, with HIV. And in the Tanzania study, I don't, I don't think they did as well. So I haven't seen anything that the cutoffs for the biomarkers would be different, but I think kind of the clinical consideration or the consideration of the whole clinical picture as a whole does change in terms of likelihood of, of different types of infections. Oh, awesome. Um, and, and then another interesting question that's come in is about um, influenza vaccine uptake in that area. Is is it mm -hmm. available, influenza vaccine? And, and if so, what sort of proportion of people make use of it? So it is not available. Um, so it is not um, part of the routine vaccination program. Um, and it is also, uh, it, it is available in, in a few select private clinics. Um, but in this particular area, there's basically zero vaccine uptake. There is, however, pretty good uh, pneumococcal vaccine coverage, uh, higher than 85% in this area. But no, there is not, not much influenza vaccine at all. And I wonder also if, if COVID is going to change this, like this landscape a bit, you know, because it's quite unusual in most settings to get a nasopharyngeal swab unless you're, you know, in a very you know, kind of first world environment for respiratory tract illnesses, but, you know, not in the COVID epidemic. People are getting a lot more nasopharyngeal swabs and maybe. You know, the potential exists then for sort of multiplex swabs. I mean, I know they obviously exist already to some degree, but I mean, do you see that as, a, as COVID as sort of like a foot in the door in this kind of setting to get more testing done in general, but especially by the nasopharyngeal swab route? I, I think that's a, a very important point. I think um, I think COVID kind of impacts this in a couple of different ways. So I think what you bring up is, is, is uh, I think it's making nasopharyngeal swabs a little bit more, uh, uh, I guess, maybe not expected, but uh, accepted, or at least begrudgingly tolerated <laughs> um, because they're obviously somewhat uncomfortable, but you know, not terrible. Um, and actually uh, we're working with a company in the US that makes a, a quad test that tests for COVID, flu, um, flu A and B and RSV. 
um, using the Gene Expert platform, which does require, you know, a box device that requires electricity, but it's a simple cartridge that and re doesn't require a whole lot of lab processing. So we're going to take a look at, at using that, hopefully, um, at, in Bugoye Health Center to kind of see now that COVID is here, what other um, what proportion is COVID versus influenza versus RSV, and it can be done all on one nasal swab. So I do think that there are a lot of opportunities for relatively simple multiplexing, but again, it requires a, a, a laboratory setting enough that um, has electricity and, and this device, which is the, the startup cost is, is quite significant. Um, I also think that, you know, as I mentioned, we're seeing patients with, with COVID with really high CRPs. So it may dilute kind of the impact that a CRP test could have in areas where, where COVID is circulating at, at high levels, because you'd see the CRP decide that maybe antibiotics were needed when truly it was just a COVID infection um, without bacterial super infection. So if, if anything, I think the COVID pandemic may kind of dilute the impact of, of these biomarker tests, unfortunately. Yeah. It is interesting though, I mean, you know, certainly from what you presented today, it seems like the, the search for individual pathogens though, I mean, with this exception, obviously with COVID mudding the waters, but is a bit less important maybe than, than the pattern of, you know, CRP, PCT, or even, you know, a transcriptome or, or something like that, which is, I suppose, in hindsight, makes more sense. I'm going to catch more, you know, you know, paint with a broader brush, which is more what you won't need anyway. But it's, you know, because a lot of these nasopharyngeal tests have gone on endlessly diagnosing more and more viruses. But as you said, it doesn't seem like that maybe, at least in these sort of settings, is the most uh, productive mm -hmm. way forward, you know, rather than using biomarkers or some other measure of bacterial versus not. I, I don't know, is, is, that, a, is that fair or, or, or have, I, have I undersold? No. <laughs> the pathogen specific um, So as an infectious disease doctor, obviously I love data and more information. So like having a positive respiratory viral test and knowing the pathogen is interesting to me from an intellectual standpoint, but it really doesn't change management, right? Other than with flu, which we have oseltamivir for uh, in the US, in Uganda, oseltamivir is not available. Um, so if anything, the kind of finding about influenza being common there is more to kind of inform policy regarding uh, immunization and, and, and prevention practices. But um, I, I, I think that what really matters is you want to identify the kids who are sick and need hospitalization and supportive care and the ones that need bacterial or need antibiotic treatment. And the rest is kind of, you know, gravy um, in the sense that, you know, it doesn't, it's not going to necessarily change your management. And so I do think kind of these host transcriptome type things are very exciting uh, <clears throat> because they kind of look at how your body is responding to whatever infection you have, and then helps you choose an appropriate course of therapy from there. And it becomes almost uh, inconsequential what the actual infection is. Now, I will say that with bacterial infections, it does matter because of antimicrobial resistance and wanting to choose the appropriate empiric therapy in the setting that you're, you're in. But at least from, until we have better antivirals, I don't think it really matters beyond, beyond influenza from a treatment standpoint. I think it matters from an epidemiology and a public health standpoint, but not from a treatment standpoint. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, <laughs> it's a long ramble. No, that, that's, that's fantastic. And then, I mean, as, as, as you say, I mean, the, the gene expert technology at least is, you know, could piggyback off a lot of the WHO's TB work, which is handy, you know, because a lot of mm -hmm. increasing number of countries you know, have access to it, which is, which is great. Mm -hmm. And then just lastly, you know, someone was asking about the feasibility of these point of care, you know, tests. Mm -hmm. So for, for something like CRP or PCT, I mean, do, do you have any sense of the the cost uh, if if countries were going to sort of embark on it uh, as a national national thing, you know, if they were going to do that at scale, let's say in, in Uganda or, or beyond. Um, so I I have not looked into that extensively, and that is something that it, that is uh, kind of on the docket to to be studied. Uh, I would say that um, there are organizations. Um, Find is one of them, which is based in Switzerland, that uh, basically is dedicated to expanding access to diagnostics. And they work with companies to develop diagnostics that are cheaper and can be used in um, resource limited settings. So for instance, recently they developed a combo malaria CRP test um, where the CRP has a cutoff of 10 and then it's an MRDT and it comes in one test and it's just like one drop of capillary blood that you put in each little well and it runs and it's very fast. Um, and they uh, worked with them to develop it at a cheap cost. Um, so that is a, a very important consideration. Right now, 
Um, for instance, the CRP point of care test that we're going to use in the health in the village health worker study is um, about a dollar eighty per test. So it's not super cheap, but again, that's not buying it at scale um, for for the country. Um, but yes, the cost is is very important. And certainly with things like molecular diagnostics, it's even more important. But um, they're becoming cheaper and cheaper as as time goes on. So hopefully that will continue. Yeah, and, and potential to save you know a lot of cost on the antibiotic side as well potentially. So mm -hmm. that's really awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's been really, really awesome. Thank you for giving us some of your time. Um, really appreciated it. I have a message, uh, sorry, a phone full of messages saying what a great talk it was. So thank you very much for, for your, your time and expertise. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Good to see you. Take see care, you. everybody. Bye.